All right, hello everyone. This is the final part of the review. This is part four, or unit four anyway, dealing with atomic and nuclear physics. It's the third video because I put units one and two together in the same video. Remember, these videos are not meant as a source of different problems for you to practice. They're meant as being kind of a catalog of everything that we've learned and what you're expected to know how to do on the diploma exam. So we've dealt with five main atomic models in this course, the Dalton model, followed by the Thomson model, followed by the Rutherford nuclear model, then the Bohr model of the atom, and finally the quantum mechanical model of the atom. You need to know the details and names of those five main atomic models. In addition, you're expected to be able to explain why one model was thrown out in favor of the next model. And as I go through the review, I'll provide you with details on all of those transitions. When cathode rays were discovered, this was the first kind of main discovery that led us to some kind of more sophisticated model of the atom compared to the Dalton model of the atom. When cathode rays were discovered, it was discovered that the particles in a cathode ray beam were smaller than the smallest atom. And those particles in the cathode ray beam, of course, we now know are electrons. And that led to a significant change in our understanding of how matter was put together in the form of atoms. Before we get to that, you should be able to look at the physics used in Thomson's charge to mass ratio experiment and basically apply that set of physics principles to any situation that's similar. When I teach this and we learn about the analysis in Thomson's charge to mass ratio of the experiment, I make a point of telling my students that none of this is really new. You learned about the physics behind all of this in unit two. What we've got is a potential difference that's accelerating these cathode ray particles, which we know are electrons. The cathode ray beam is green because the electrons interact with the air molecules producing green photons of light, but that's not important here. What's important is we have a stream of charged particles, their electrons accelerated through a potential difference. The potential difference that I'm saying they are accelerated through is this potential difference here. This is the potential difference that generates the electrons and accelerates them from rest. The physics that you can apply there is conservation of energy because that accelerating voltage has to be equal to the change in energy of the electrons divided by the charge. And in this particular case, since the cathode ray particles or electrons accelerate from rest, this can be rearranged to Q times delta V equals one half mv squared. Of course, Thomson couldn't do that analysis in that way because he didn't know the mass or the charge of these particles. Thomson is trying to determine the charge to mass ratio. The middle part of this diagram shows the cathode ray beam being undeflected. And if it's undeflected, that means the forces acting on the particles in the beam are balanced. And there's an electric field due to the voltage here that generates a voltage between the plates producing an electric field and there's a magnetic field as well. I haven't got the magnetic field labeled but all of these X's are indicating that the magnetic field is into the page in this entire region. So the magnetic force created by the magnetic field must be equal in magnitude to the electric force generated by the electric field and you can do your analysis by starting with that point. In the third region where the electric field isn't present because the plates don't extend that far, this is the circular motion analysis that we looked at in unit two. So you can write that the magnetic force equals the net force and proceed from there. Maybe I will go back and just say here in this middle region where we have Fm equals Fe, at least the magnitudes, this would turn into QVB equals QE. And the FM equals F net here would eventually turn into QVB equals MV squared over R. Dalton model of the atom is almost childlike in its simplicity. 
John Dalton said that atoms are composed of tiny, hard, indivisible spheres. Indivisible is where we get the word atom from. But it does not take into account the presence of electrons. So when Thompson discovered electrons in the form of cathode rays, we had to tweak, or Thompson had to tweak, this model of the atom of Dalton's. And he did it by including the electrons as being these tiny, tiny negatively charged particles which are scattered throughout this sphere of positiveness, which he called the sphere of positive fluid. The flaw with this model of the atom is that when we get to alpha scattering in our study of the history of atomic models, the way that alpha particles are scattered by a gold foil is not explainable using this model of the atom. This model of the atom could never explain why an alpha particle is deflected through a severe angle when it is when it bounces back from the gold foil. We learned how Millikan determined the elementary charge. Basically, he determined experimentally the charge on hundreds, if not thousands, of tiny, tiny microscopic oil drops that have been charged. And he reasoned out that in order for them to have those charges that they did have, all of those charges turned out to be a multiple of a certain number. And that number, of course, is the elementary charge, 1.6 multiplied by 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Make sure that you're able to perform a force analysis in any kind of oil drop scenario. By the way, it doesn't have to be an oil drop. Sometimes it's a small plastic sphere. And again, I want to point out to you that the physics behind what I'm going to show you here is not new. This is a combination between physics 20, where we have competing forces or multiple forces acting on the same object, and it also includes some information from unit 2. So if you have a charged drop which is not accelerating, and that means it's either stationary or it's moving at a constant velocity, then that means that the forces acting on it must be balanced. The net force is zero. So your analysis would start by saying Fe equals Fg. And you'd go to your formula sheet, and for Fe, you would put charge times electric field, and for Fg, you would put mass times gravitational field, and for the electric field, you would probably continue by changing electric field to voltage between the plates divided by distance between the plates. But that's up to you to go back and look at some of those examples. If the drop is accelerating up, there's only one explanation for that, and that's that the electric force produced by the electric field between the plates in the experiment is up and greater than the gravitational force. And that means that the net force, and this is where the physics 20 comes in, the net force is the magnitude of the larger force minus the magnitude of the smaller force. So F net equals Fe minus Fg. And what this equation here would translate into what this equation here would translate into is MA equals QE minus MG. And you'd proceed from there. If the drop is accelerating down, but it's accelerating down at maybe, I'm just going to pick a number here, 7 meters per second squared. 7 meters per second squared as a magnitude of acceleration is smaller than the acceleration due to gravity as a magnitude. And that means that there must be an electric force up, but it's smaller than the force of gravity down. In which case, the net force, again, from physics 20, is equal to the magnitude of the larger force minus the magnitude of the opposing smaller force. So here we would get F net equals Fg minus Fe, or Ma equals Mg minus Qe. There's another situation where the drop can be accelerating down, and that's if it's accelerating down at, and again, I'm going to pick a number here, at 20 meters per second squared. If it's accelerating down at a value where the magnitude of that acceleration is more than gravity would supply, which is 9.81 meters per second squared, then that means that both forces must be in the same direction, 
So the net force is the sum of the magnitudes, and you would end up with MA equals MG plus QE. Rutherford scattering experiments led to a different structure of the atom. I'm not going to go through the exact experiment, but based on the distribution of how the alpha particles are scattered, Rutherford concluded correctly that this is a better picture of what an atom looks like. We call it Rutherford's nuclear atom, or nuclear model of the atom. And you can see there's a nucleus. I'm going to blow this nucleus up for you, just so you can see it a little better. This is what we're talking about. So in the nucleus, we have a series of protons and neutrons. In physics 30, we do not get into the discovery of protons and the discovery of neutrons, but that's okay. And then orbiting the nucleus at very large distances are the electrons. And this vast region of empty space explains why many alpha particles, about 95% of them, make it through a gold foil with very little deflection. And it's because they don't encounter anything substantial. But the odd one encounters that very tiny nucleus, and a few more get close enough to the nucleus to be deflected through larger angles, but not deflected backwards. There's a problem with this model of the atom, and well, there are two problems we talk about in Physics 30. One is, when you look at the atomic line spectra of even the simplest atom, that should say even the simplest atom, like hydrogen, the line spectrum for hydrogen contains four lines, and Rutherford's model of the atom can't explain it. There's just as serious a problem with this model of the atom, and that's that it contains accelerating charges. Those electrons are in a circular orbit around the nucleus, and that means they're experiencing an acceleration. Maxwell's principles of electromagnetism say that anytime you have an accelerating charge, you're going to have electromagnetic radiation being produced. But atoms don't continually produce electromagnetic radiation, which means whatever the electrons are doing, they cannot be accelerating. So Rutherford's model has a couple of huge flaws in it. We need to take a detour now away from atomic models and review types of spectra. So one type of spectrum, spectra is plural for spectra. Spectra, <laughs> spectra is plural for spectrum. One type of spectrum is a continuous spectrum, and it's produced by the light that's emitted from a glowing solid, which is called a black body. Now, a black body emits typically a a whitish color light, it may appear kind of yellow or orange. So in order for us to see all of the colors, we have to pass that light through a spectroscope. And all a spectroscope is is some device that separates all of the different colors of light into the wavelengths. So it takes the mixture, breaks it apart into the separate colors. A spectrometer, I'm being very picky here, but a spectrometer differs from a spectroscope because a spectrometer will allow us to actually measure the wavelengths of the light. If you look at the light being emitted from a hot gas and you pass it through a spectroscope, you get what's called a bright line or emission spectrum. And if you take a look at shining the light from a black body, now, I want to make sure that you understand what's going on here. This light here is the light that's coming off of the black body. So that's the light that's going into the cool gas. And apparently, well, not apparently, I don't know why I used that word, what happens is not all of these wavelengths, not all of that continuous spectrum make it out of the cool gas. Some of the wavelengths are absorbed. And I want you to notice that the wavelengths that are emitted in the bright line spectrum are the same as the wavelengths that are absorbed in the dark line spectrum. That tells us the gas is the same. Just jumping ahead here, the explanation for this is that when electrons in atoms fall from one energy level to another, they emit a specific photon or a specific wavelength. 
these bright lines correspond to electrons in the hot gas falling or jumping, sometimes we use the word, to lower levels, whereas the wavelengths that are missing from the dark line spectrum correspond to electrons being popped up to higher levels by absorbing the right photons from the black body. I want to go through just some visuals here of different spectrometers. A diffraction grating spectrometer, what you're looking at here is a picture of a gas discharge tube. This is hydrogen gas, and you would have done this experiment in your Physics 30 class. When I pass that through a diffraction grating, I get this purple line, this kind of reddish purple line that's going through. That's the n equals 1, or pardon me, that's the n equals 0 maximum, and that's just the color of the light that's being emitted from the gas discharge tube. We also get these four very specific wavelengths. You get a violet, a blue, a green, and a red. So the red, green, blue, and violet at the top are the n equals 1 bright line spectrum, and the red, green, blue, and violet at the bottom are the n equals 2 bright line spectrum. This is actually a spectrometer, which means we can calculate the wavelengths of these four. And I don't know if you did this in your section, but in my section of Physics 30, we do this lab and calculations. Basically, we use lambda equals d sine theta over n to determine the wavelengths. We determine the distance between the openings in the diffraction grating by first doing an experiment with the diffraction grating and a laser of known wavelength. And then we measure these angles of these four lines, and we get the wavelengths. A prism spectrometer, I've got the same setup here, but I'm going to pass that light through a prism, uses the principle of refraction. And again, there's a way for you to measure, in some way, the wavelengths. It's a little more involved, but you can use Snell's law along with the index of refraction of light in air. There's a bit of a typing mistake on the word light there to find the index of refraction of the red light in the glass. And then you can look at a reference table to determine the wavelength that has that index of refraction. Then you would repeat it with the green and the blue and the violet. So getting back to our three types of spectra, if I look at a continuous spectrum with a diffraction grading spectrometer, this is what I'm talking about. If I look at a bright line spectrum, this is what I'm talking about, and these happen to be the four wavelengths of the hydrogen bright line spectrum, and this is what we would see with a dark line spectrum with hydrogen. So I have the black body here in the form of a glowing solid and a light bulb. This cannot be an LED bulb. It needs to be what's called an incandescent bulb, one of those old school bulbs that has a filament. And in this container right here is the hydrogen gas. So you need to know what each of these three spectra look like, the dark line spectrum, the bright line spectrum, and the continuous spectrum. That leads to one other thing about spectra and spectroscopes or spectrometers. When you're using a diffraction grating spectrometer or a diffraction grating spectroscope, you're always going to get pairs of spectra. So this happens to be a continuous spectrum we're looking at through a diffraction grating spectrometer. But you don't just get one spectrum, you get two. And you could get four spectra because these two are only the n equals one spectra, but you could have an n equals two. So diffraction grating spectrometers will always produce pairs of spectra and the red will always be deviated more from the undeviated white light than the violet. On the other hand, when you're looking at a prism spectroscope, you always only get one spectrum, and you should know that the red light is deviated less than the violet. The Bohr atomic model, this is the one that can now explain line spectra. It becomes less visual. We don't walk around saying that this is what an atom looks like. This is what's called an energy level diagram for the atom. And it says that in the Bohr atomic model, the electron exists in what are called stationary states. It doesn't mean the electron is stationary. It means that it's stable in a particular energy state.
And what that means is that when the electron is in a particular state, it has a constant energy. And what that means is it doesn't radiate electromagnetic radiation out of the atom as long as it's in that state. If an electron jumps, we often use the word jump here, from one state to a higher state, generally speaking, that's accomplished by the electron or the atom in general absorbing a photon. But the photon that's absorbed has to be exactly the same energy as the energy required to cause that electron transition. If an electron, however, jumps to a different level that's lower, it's going to emit a photon. And the key idea here is that whatever the change in the energy of the electron is, that has to be the energy of the photon involved in the transition. Bohr's model of the atom does have some flaws as well. It's only able to explain the line spectra of any atom in group 1A, which means all of the atoms with one valence electron. Hydrogen, what else is there? Sodium, potassium, I think cesium, rubidium, francium, all of those atoms in group 1A of your periodic table. We use this idea to calculate photon energies or photon wavelengths. So remember that the energy of the photon that's either absorbed or emitted is not equal to the energy of the electron. It's equal to the energy change of the electron. So you can always, this is conservation of energy, use E photon equals delta E of the electron, but unlike every other place in this course, we always use upper energy minus lower energy. You don't want to say final energy minus initial energy. All we are interested in is looking at the energy level diagram and finding out how much energy there is between the two levels. If you're ever missing an upper level, then take that photon energy and add it to the lower level. If you're ever missing the lower level, take that photon energy and subtract it from the upper level. The quantum mechanical model of the atom is the king or queen of models of the atom. It is able to explain all known spectra of all atoms. What do you need to know about it? You need to know that it deals with probabilities of electron location and not certainties. And you need to know that it's very mathematical and it's not at all a visual model of the atom. It's so mathematical, in fact, we can't even begin in high school to look at the formulas involved in describing this model of the atom. We get into alpha, beta, and gamma decay next. Alpha decay consists of rays of alpha particles. Beta decay consists of rays of high-speed electrons. And gamma decay consists of rays that are composed of gamma ray photons. So the gamma ray photons that I'm talking about here are the same gamma ray photons that are on the electromagnetic spectrum. I think it's important that you're able to predict based on the direction of a magnetic field, which we have in this diagram into the plane of paper, how these three beams are deflected. Gamma rays have no charge, so they're not deflected. Alpha rays are deflected in the direction that positive particles would be deflected. Beta rays, of course, are defect deflected in the direction that negative particles are deflected. And they're deflected significantly more because electrons have a very low mass compared to alpha particles. You're also expected to know the different penetrabilities of these particles. Alpha, alpha radiation can be stopped by paper, but beta radiation will go right through paper. However, you can stop beta radiation with, uh, we'll say a five millimeters of aluminum would do the trick, maybe a centimeter of aluminum just to be sure. But gamma rays will go through paper and aluminum. They require a significant thickness of lead to be stopped. And again, if you were in my Physics 30 class, we do this experiment with a Geiger counter, so hopefully that helps you remember what's going on. Biological damage. Very often students get this backwards. They look at this diagram and they go, well, since gamma radiation 
is the most penetrable. It has the most energy, so it can do the most damage. That's true to some extent, but you have to recognize that when radiation is stopped, the energy that those particles had is used to damage whatever the material is that stopped them. So in terms of biological damage, when I tell you that alpha radiation is stopped by the first few layers of your skin, that means that all of the energy that the alpha particles had is absorbed by that skin in a very, very tiny concentrated space. And every time the alpha particle collides with one of the molecules in your skin, that alpha particle does damage to it. And the alpha particle loses some energy. So then it bumps into another molecule in your skin, very, very close in vicinity to the first molecule or atom in your skin. And the result is there are probably anywhere from 1,000 to 10,000 collisions in a very small space and then alpha particle comes to a rest, damaging a significant number of cells or atoms. All forms are harmful, of course, but alpha radiation presents the greatest risk, particularly if you ingest it. it you don't ingest alpha radiation, but if I ingested a material that was emitting alpha rays and it got lodged in my throat or in my lung tissue, then it's going to continue to cause damage in that very tiny space. Decay equations. We're going to start with alpha decay. So if I said that radon, I think that's radium actually, radium-222 undergoes alpha decay, you need to know that an alpha particle has that notation. To determine what's produced or what the daughter nucleus is, you would add up the top numbers on the left and get 222, which means there are 222 nucleons. You would then say, since I have four nucleons in the alpha particle, I need another 218. You do the same thing with the bottom numbers, which represent charge. I know they represent protons, but they only represent protons some of the time. Those bottom numbers always represent charge. And we have positive 88 for a charge on the left, so we need positive 88 on the right, which gives us 86. That means that the daughter nucleus has 86 positive charge, which means it has 86 um, protons. So then we can look on our periodic table and see that it's radon. So the top number is determined by using conservation of nucleons. The bottom number is used by, by applying conservation of charge. Gamma rays, if we take, for example, the gamma decay of lead 207, a gamma ray photon has no nucleons and no charge, which means that the top and bottom numbers stay the same. During gamma decay, what happens is the nucleons in the nucleus rearrange themselves into a more stable arrangement. So we put an asterisk beside that indicating it's an excited nucleus. Beta decay, I'm picking as an example here the beta decay of carbon-14. You need to know that beta decay has a symbol of zero for the number of nucleons and negative one for the charge, and it's the beta symbol. You also need to know that it is always accompanied by a antineutrino. And to find out what we have left, you look at the conservation of nucleons, and we have 14 on the top of the left, so we need 14 on the right. We have six on the left for charge. We need a total of six on the right. Well, seven plus negative one is six. Then we can look at our periodic table and see that we're dealing with nitrogen. Positron decay. Sorry. You also should be able to look at the numbers of nucleons before and after beta decay to determine what's happening in terms of protons and neutrons. To begin with, the carbon has six protons, but afterwards the nitrogen has seven. So you've gained the proton, but since the top number has not changed, you've lost the neutron. So the net change in this beta decay is a neutron decays into a proton, an electron, and an antineutrino. 
Positron decay, of course, a positron is a positive electron. So when you see this notation here that has plus one, that does not mean one proton. Since the top number of that positron is zero, there are no nucleons. The bottom number is charge. It means there's a positive one for a charge in the form of a positive electron. So again, you look at the top number, which is conservation of nucleons. We have 22 on the top of the left. That means we need 22 in total on the top of the right. We have 11 on the left, and we have one on the right for charge, which means we need another 10 more. You look up number 10, you see that it's neon. And by counting the number of protons and neutrons, you should be able to determine that during positron decay, a proton decays into a neutron, a positron, and a neutrino. There's also something called electron capture, which you're often asked about on diploma exams. During electron capture, an electron is literally captured by the nucleus. So what's important here is that the electron is added to the nucleus. The electron isn't spit out of the nucleus. In the process, a neutrino is emitted, and usually the resulting nucleus is unstable and it emits a series of gamma ray photons to become more stable. I've already addressed this, but the electron has to be written on the left side. And I know I've put E for electron here. If you want to put B for beta, that's up to you. But I'm looking at the electron capture of cobalt-27. So I add the electron to the cobalt-27. You're told that there's a neutrino emitted, so what else is produced? While well, the top number must still be 60 due to conservation of nucleons, the bottom number must be 26, which means it's iron 26. And again, by counting the number of protons before and after and the number of neutrons before and after, you can determine that the net change during electron capture is that a proton and an electron get together to produce a neutron and a neutrino. Mass defect and binding energy, if you were to disassemble a nucleus into all of its separate nucleons, there will be a difference in the mass. The mass of the separated nucleons will always be more than the mass of the assembled nucleus. And that difference is called the mass defect. The energy required to accomplish that task, not that you do it, but the energy required to accomplish it is called the binding energy of the nucleus. And this is an important idea in nuclear physics because the binding energy of a nucleus is really a measure of how well held together that nucleus is. The relationship between the mass defect and the binding energy is that of Einstein's mass energy equivalence formula. The change in energy equals the change in the mass times the speed of light squared, where the change in energy is the binding energy and the change in the mass is the mass defect. What does this mean? If you were to look at the binding energy per nucleon, and that just means you would calculate a binding energy and divide by the number of nucleons in that particular nucleus. If you were to plot all of the binding energies as a function per nucleon, as a function of the atomic mass number, you get this curve. And essentially, you need to know that the greater the binding energy per nucleon, the more stable the isotope is. So any process that's naturally occurring, and I like to really, really stress this when we talk about all nuclear changes, any nuclear change that's naturally occurring must be exothermic, and that means things must become more stable, which means that any natural nuclear process will increase the binding energy per nucleon. And it turns out the most stable isotope that we are aware of is iron 56. It has the highest binding energy per nucleon. Half-life equation is given to you on your formula sheet. Make sure you know what all of these variables are. If you ever need to determine the half-life so that you can determine how many half-lives elapse, you can always go to a graph 
the half-life is literally the period of time it takes for the isotope to decay to one half of its original amount. Fission and fusion, I want to run through the similarities and differences. First of all, differences. What fission is, is when a large nucleus is made unstable by smacking it with a neutron. So when you introduce that neutron into the party, that new nucleus is very, very unstable, and it does what we call fission. It undergoes fission, and it breaks apart into smaller nuclei and other neutrons. And those other neutrons can then collide with nuclei that have not yet undergone fission to produce more fission. The products are always radioactive. So whatever those smaller nuclei are, they're always radioactive. We do have the technology to build, and we have built and do use fission nuclear reactors to generate electricity. However, the fuel is very limited, and because it's limited, it's very expensive, and it's also physically difficult to refine. Fusion, on the other hand, has smaller nuclei. Now, nuclei are positive, so in order to get them close enough so they don't push away, you have to get within, I'm going to say, about a femtometer and at about a femtometer, the strong nuclear force pulls them together. In order to get them that close, you have to have a very, very, very high amount of kinetic energy in the particles, which means a high temperature. However, when you do accomplish that, they produce a larger nucleus and usually a neutron, but not always. They can produce other fragments. The products are not radioactive, which is a benefit over fission. And working fusion reactors, however, this is the downfall of generating electricity. We are not anywhere near the stage of having working fusion reactors to solve our energy needs. Uh, the fuel is very abundant, though. If we can overcome some technological hurdles in building these fusion reactors, then we will have a lot of very cheap energy. Both of these types of nuclear changes are exothermic. They both release energy. They both lose mass because mass is converted to energy. And that means that the nuclei that are produced are more stable, nuclearly speaking, than the original nuclei, which means the binding energies have increased. Nuclear energy change, and this could be fission, fusion, radioactive decay, it could be mass defect, it could be a mass energy converter in Star Trek, it doesn't matter. All nuclear changes involve conservation of what we call mass energy. Now what that means is that the mass in the system can go down or the mass in the system can go up as long as an equivalent amount of energy is involved. So if mass is converted to energy, the mass in the system goes down. If energy is converted to mass, the mass in the system goes up. If it's an exothermic process, then, and these include fission, fusion, any naturally occurring radioactive decay, then there is a loss in mass and energy is removed from the system. Energy is released, it's exothermic. If it's endothermic, some forms of artificial transmutation, then energy is being added to the system and that results in an increase in mass. In either case, if you want to know the relationship between the change in the mass and the change in the energy, you use Einstein's mass energy equivalence formula. Note, and this is, I'm just putting this here as a point because on diploma exams this can be tricky, that fission and fusion both involve an increase in binding energy per nucleon. Even though the total energy in the system goes down, the binding energy per nucleon must go up. You're expected to know what the four fundamental forces are, gravitational, weak nuclear, electromagnetic, and strong nuclear. You're expected to know the order in terms of strength. And if you look at the top here where the number one is in the middle column, if we assign gravity a strength of one, 
then in the nucleus, the weak nuclear force is 10 to the 32 times greater, the electromagnetic is 10 to the 36 times greater, and the strong nuclear force, the nuclear glue that holds the nucleons together, is 10 to the 38 times greater. You are expected to know the range over which these act. You are expected to know the mediating particles in the standard model of matter that produce these forces. And I believe, I think it's important for you to note that the graviton, the hypothesized mediating particle to explain gravity, has not been detected. I'm not going to go through all of these. You're going to have to do some studying on your own for that. Due to the size of the strong nuclear force, if you want to discover new particles, and the analogy I use in my classes, when I was given toys as a child, after I was done having my fun with them, I would very often break them apart. I'd take a hammer or I'd smash them because I was curious as a child and I wanted to know what was inside of these things. I wanted to figure out how it worked. So if I want to figure out if there's something inside of an atom, I have to smash that atom apart. But the nuclei are held together in an atom with the strong nuclear force, which is immense. It's 10 to the 38 times bigger than the force of gravity. So that means if I want to smash atoms, I need particle accelerators. I also need devices that allow me to see the pieces that come flying out, and those are bubble and cloud chambers. And what I would say to you is you need to be able to apply the physics of unit two, which is electric and magnetic forces and fields, whenever called upon in a question that involves accelerating particles in a synchrotron, or cyclotrons accelerating particles, or particles being deflected with a certain radius in a bubble chamber or a cloud chamber. All of the physics in terms of calculations for this bottom part of the screen that you're looking at are physics principles that we've already talked about. You should be able to interpret qualitatively tracks in a bubble chamber. So for example, if we know that there is a magnetic field directed into the page, you should be able to determine that this is the path or track created by a positive particle by using the right-hand rule. You should be able to predict or explain what's going on with all of these with the right-hand rule. Standard model of matter says that all matter is composed of fermions. Every single thing in the universe with substance is composed of fermions. And there are 12 of them. There are also 12 anti-fermions, but we'll get to that. The fermions can be classified into what are called leptons or into what are called quarks. And one example of a lepton that you're very familiar with is an electron. An electron is a lepton. Another example that you're somewhat familiar with is an electron neutrino. When we talk about beta decay, and I say that a beta particle is emitted and it's always accompanied by an anti-neutrino, I'm talking about an anti-electron neutrino. So there are six leptons, there's an electron, an electron neutrino, and there are two other pairs of particles that we don't have to concern ourselves with. The key idea behind leptons is leptons are lone particles. They don't like to bond together with other particles to form more complex particles. Quarks, on the other hand, the other six fermions, which include the up and the down quarks as well as four others, do form more complex particles called hadrons, which include the proton and the neutron. You need to know the property of the electron, the electron neutrino, the up quark, and the down quark, so that's four particles, four fermions, as well as all of their antiparticles, and that gives us a total of eight particles you need to know the properties of. That information is on one side of your formula sheet. Finally, you need to know the the quark structure of a proton. A proton is actually composed of an up, up, and down quark, and the charges of those quarks are given on your formula sheet. 
a down, down, up quark, or an up, down, down is a neutron. And you need to be able to explain what's going on with beta and positron decay, as well as electron capture, using this model of matter. So for example, with beta decay, when we learned about beta decay earlier in this video, I talked about the fact that beta decay involved a neutron decaying to a proton and an electron and an antineutrino. Since a neutron is an up-down-down down quark combination and a proton is an up-up-down quark combination, that means that beta decay involves one of those down quarks in the neutron changing to an up quark. And this is the net change for beta decay. When you look at positron decay earlier on, we said that positron decay involved a proton changing to a neutron, a positron, and a neutrino. Well, a proton has two ups and a down quark. A neutron has an up and two down, which means in this process, we lose an up and gain a down, plus the electron, plus the neutrino. And for electron capture, we learned that a proton and an electron get together, producing a neutron and a neutrino. But a proton is an up, up, down. It changes into a neutron, which is an up, down, down. That means that an up quark changes to a down quark, but this time it's done by adding an electron to the up quark. If you wanted to be fancy, what you could do is rewrite these, but put charges. If you look at the beta decay, the charge of a down quark is negative one-third elementary charge. An up quark is positive two-thirds. An electron is negative one. An antineutrino is zero. So you could write these as being the net change during beta decay, positron decay, and electron capture. That's it for this unit and for the course review. So good luck with everything. Take care.